The terrible story of Mallory and Irvine, the first real summiteers of Mount Everest. In the early dawn of mountaineering history, a daring duo embarked on a quest that would forever etch their names into legend Mallory and Irvine, the fearless souls who set their sights on Mount Everest's unforgiving summit. Amidst the breathtaking vistas and death-defying challenges, their indomitable spirit beckons us, drawing us closer to a heart-wrenching tale of determination and sacrifice. Brace yourselves for an epic journey of triumph and tragedy as we unravel the untold chapters of their formidable ascent. The 1924 British Mount Everest Expedition was after the 1922 British Mount Everest Expedition, the second expedition with the goal of achieving the first ascent of Mount Everest. After two summit attempts in which Edward Norton set a world altitude record of 8,000, 572.8 meters, 28,126 feet. The mountaineers George Mallory and Andrew Sandy Irvine disappeared on the third attempt. Their disappearance has given rise to the long-standing speculation of whether or not the pair might, under a very narrow set of wishful assumptions, have reached the summit. Mallory's body was found in 1999 at 8,000. 156 meters, 26,760 feet, but the resulting clues did not provide any conclusive evidence as to whether the summit was reached. It was the first time that any human beings would be trying to step in the close vicinity of Chamalungma, the highest mountain on planet Earth, as they neared the environs of Everest from Camp Adzong. A sense of great anticipation swept up to Mallory. To Winthrop Young he wrote, we are just about to walk off the map. His first proper view of Everest was something he would never forget. To Ruth, his wife, he described it vividly. Suddenly our eyes caught a glint of snow through the clouds. A whole group of mountains began to appear in gigantic fragments. Mountain shapes are often fantastic seen through a mist. These were like the wildest creation of a dream. A preposterous triangular lump rose out of the depths. Its edge came leaping up at an angle of about 70 degrees and ended nowhere. To its left a black serrated crest was hanging in the sky incredibly. Gradually, very gradually, we saw the great mountain sides and glaciers and areeds. Now one fragment, and now another through the floating rifts, until far higher in the sky than imagination had dared to suggest, the white summit of Everest appeared. There is no doubt that Everest had cast a spell on the man. Lead by Howard Berry, the expedition was largely a surveying effort. For the attempt on the summit though a route had to be first identified. The base camp was established on the Rongbuk Glacier in late June at 5,000 meters, and from there much of the exploration was done regarding documenting the various glaciers and lesser peaks in the vicinity of Everest. Survey and map the Everest region, and explore the mountain from the north, east, and up to the edge of the west. Mallory invariably led the way in exploring the mountain, while Oliver Wheeler from the Survey of India meticulously surveyed the region. Ironically, it was Wheeler who discovered the approach route to North Kaul and to the now standard route to Everest from the Tibetan side through the East Rongbuk Glacier. Mallory missed it, even though he had seen the East Rongbuk Glacier. However, Mallory did everything else opened up the approaches to Everest from the beautiful Karta Valley. Seeing the stupendous east face of Everest, identified the route up the North Call, and also looked into the Western Kum and the Southern Route. He opined that the Southern Route would be a difficult climb. The 1921 exploration logically led to the next expedition, with an aim to climb Mount Everest in 1922. By then the East Rongbuk Glacier's importance was realized and immediately utilized to advance via lesser camps. To advance base camp below the North Call, a 300-meter high ice-walled saddle between Everest's North Ridge and Change until Camp 4 was established on the North Call itself. The team also included George Finch, who was to pioneer the use of oxygen, the English air, as the Sherpa would call it on the mountain. This expedition's aim to reach the summit employed two different approaches, a classical alpine-style attempt without the use of supplemental oxygen, and a new style with oxygen equipment, Based on the high-altitude flying research from recent years, the North Call was reached by Mallory and Howard Somerville on May 11. By May 20, the first attempt on the summit was made in classical style with Mallory and his colleagues who by this stage were weary from the struggles in establishing camps and battling the weather, as well as their own failing health in this harsh environment. Nonetheless, after rising at 5.30 am, they finally departed at 7 am 
and established Camp 5 at 7,600 meters that day. The next day, after rising at 6.30 a.m., Mallory, Somerville, and Edward Norton struggled up the North Ridge to 8,225 meters by 2 p.m. before turning around with an altitude record. Next was the attempt with an oxygen apparatus as advocated by the Australian, George Finch. With few fit men available, Finch departed with Geoffrey Bruce and Agurka, Tejbur on May 25. They reached 7,460 meters from their Camp 5 and finally departed on May 27 using oxygen. Tejbur gave up at 7,925, but Finch and Bruce did reach a new record of 8,325 meters, but could go no further due to Bruce's equipment failing. How far they could have climbed is open to debate, but the climb gave Mallory a new perspective about reaching the summit of Everest. The 1922 expedition in some sense can be compared to the first human foray into space, where every step had an unknown outcome. The 1922 expedition had many firsts to its credit. The identification of the Northeast Ridge Route, with its two rock step obstacles on the ridge of which so much was to happen later, and the first use of oxygen high in the death zone. The next expedition launched in 1924 was a culmination of the efforts initiated in 1921 and incorporating the lessons learned from the previous expeditions. Mallory, now 37 years of age, knew that his time was running out and was prepared to give all that it took for the summit. He had a premonition of the outcome between him and the mountain and ventured that perhaps he was not coming back from the attempt. This expedition was beset with bad weather in May, and Mallory's attempt was aborted early. Finally, Edward Norton and Somerville made a summit attempt on June 4, where Norton alone reached 8,572 meters after crossing the Great Kulor before he abandoned the attempt. That was an epic climb without oxygen, and a record which was broken after five decades in 1978 by Reinhold Messner and Peter Habler. Mallory, chafing on the North Coal in the meanwhile, had decided that there would be one last attempt on the mountain. It would be made by him and young Irvine, and they would use oxygen. Destiny seemed beckoned Mallory, as he probably did not relish the prospect of coming down the mountain without the summit. Thus, on June 8 in the final throw of dice, Mallory, now with a new climbing partner in Andrew, Sandy Irvine, departed from Camp 6, likely at or before dawn. Their support climber Noel Odell, at 12.50 p.m., had just climbed to about 8,000 meters. Pausing for a rest, he looked up towards the summit ridge. Odell then described what happened. There was a sudden clearing in the atmosphere, and the entire summit ridge and final peak of Everest were unveiled. My eyes became fixed on one tiny black spot silhouetted on a small snow crest beneath a rock step in the ridge. The black spot moved. Another black spot became apparent and moved up to join the other on the crest. The first then approached the great rock step and shortly emerged at the top. The second did likewise. Then the whole fascinating vision vanished enveloped in clouds once more. The Wire reports that Noel Odell, another climber on the expedition, watched as Mallory and Irvine left the base camp. On June 8, Odell saw two tiny dots presumed to be the climbers near Everest's summit. After that, the pair would never be seen again. Gript writes that it's unknown if Mallory and Irvine actually made it to the top. What Odell witnessed could have been the climbers either going up or coming down the summit. What is known, however, is that Mallory had taken a vest pocket Kodak camera with him to provide proof that he and Irvine had made it to the summit. In 1999, 75 years after the first possible summit attempt, a special expedition was set up to find answers surrounding Mallory's death. The expedition was instigated by British climber Graham Hoyland. It was organized by regular Everest expedition leader Eric Simonson and advised by researcher Jochen Hemblop with a team of climbers from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Germany. Hemlib's investigations of reports of earlier sightings and photographs had led him to identify what he believed was the area in which Irvine's body lay, some distance below where his ice axe had been found by Percy Wynne Harris on the expedition, led by Hugh Rutledge in 1933. The team hoped in particular to find a camera on Irvine's body, which, had the pair been successful, should have contained a picture of the summit. After commencing the search on 1 May 1999, Conrad Anker mistakenly got off course and, surprisingly, found Mallory's body, not Irvine's. Mallory lay face down, 
arms outstretched as if to break a sliding fall, with one broken leg and a serious wound to the skull, but otherwise very well preserved. It seemed probable that he had been a victim of a fall while roped to Irvine. The body was only an hour or two from the safety of camp. Many artifacts were found on the body, including a pocket knife, altimeter and snow goggles, but no camera. Finally, it had been reported that Mallory carried a photograph of his beloved wife Ruth with him, which he planned to place on the summit in the event of success. It was not found among his remaining personal possessions.